Thank you, praise team. Let's stand together, please, for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to listen. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, friends. Good morning, grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. Uh, today I want to put on just a tad of the Baptist hat, okay? A tad of the old street, you know, tent revival, all right? So if you feel so led, shout out a couple of amens. It's okay, all right? Kind of give me a little encouragement there. Uh, today I want to uh, talk about being saved. You know, have you been asked that? Are you saved? You know, that some of the our more evangelically inclined friends are, are really good at that. You know, uh, uh, every time you go to church, you're out. Are you saved? Do you know you're saved? Come on down and, and be saved and so forth. And it is true. I mean, the Church of Jesus Christ, our ministry is to save sinners, all right? Uh, Paul will say in our second lesson that it is a fitting save statement. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That was his ministry. Or we could say, uh, he came to save souls, right? Have you ever had that sense of having your, you want your soul to be saved? All right, I think everybody, anybody not want their soul to be saved? All right, I hope I'm among friends. Everybody wants Jesus to save their souls. But to get to that point, I need you to put on your imagination hat a little bit. Uh, I, I need you to think a little bit, uh, and we're probably some of us a little older imagination might come. I hope it doesn't, uh, but it might come a little bit more difficultly. Uh, but I want you to imagine this. I want you to think of your life Imagine your life as a river. You got that? Okay, this is going to make sense, I hope, all right? Uh, imagine your life as a river. You know, you know, the river flowing along the depth or rapids and currents and, you know, times of turmoil in your river and times of calm and so forth. But above all, I want you to imagine direction. Which way is the river of your life going? Is it like the mighty Mississippi that's heading south into the Gulf of Mexico? Or is it like the Nile heading north, dumping into the uh, Mediterranean? Or is it like the Amazon that moves east and heads out into the Atlantic Ocean? What is the direction? Imagine your life as a river. What is the direction? But most importantly, I want you to imagine the river bed, all right? Because the river bed, you know, a river really isn't the water because the water just changes all the time, right? A river is its river bed. That's what really gives shape and form to the river. If there is no river bed, there is no river, right? You can't hold anything together without a river bed. Now, the reason I've got you imagine all this is because when we want to talk about the difference between your body and your soul, all right? What is the difference between your body and your soul. Well, this is a classic illustration, and I'm borrowing from a theologian by the name of Peter Kreeft, who teaches at Boston College, who borrowed from St. Thomas Aquinas, who borrowed from Aristotle, so I'm in good company, all right? So I can borrow this stuff too. The analogy of the river and the riverbed, our bodies are like the water in a river. The water changes, it evaporates. Water is added by rain, like the molecules of our bodies. This flesh changes every seven years. All the molecules in your body change. You're not the same literal body as you were 10 years ago. Obviously, right? Everything changes like a river. That's the flesh, your muscle, and all the rest. All those molecules change. Our souls are like the river bread, bed. That's what gives shape 
and direction and form to our flesh. My soul, you see, is really that gets, gives shape to my life, to my body, to the form of my life. Um, Peter Kreeft, to quote him, um, and I, I love this quote, but it takes a little while to get used to it, but think about it. The body is in the soul like water is in the riverbed. We usually think, you know, my, my soul's in my body kind of a thing, but the body is in the soul, not the soul in the body. It's like a river. A river is not its water, which is always moving on, but its riverbed, which forms the formless water into a river. Now, that is the classic distinction between body and soul. We have a tendency to think of the soul as kind of that ghost-like um, spirit-like non-material stuff that somehow is connected to us rather than thinking of our souls as everything about us that gives shape and direction to our life you are a living soul as am I my life is moving in a certain direction for better or worse and that is my soul at work you see directing my body, giving shape and form to my entire life. So, to channel our lives into the purposes of God is to be saved. To be saved is when the direction of our life changes. We, we, we have a new river bed which shapes our life guides our life into the kingdom of God. To be saved is not just kind of like, well, I'm good to go, I'm checked off when I die. No, to be saved is to have a different direction in our life because often our lives are misdirected and that's what it means to be lost is when our lives are misdirected. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The terrible and frightening possibility is that our souls could lead our bodies to a cesspool. Our souls could lead our bodies to empty out into some place that is not fitting for a human being to be. We have a goal, to use a fancy word, a telos, a purpose. Jesus Christ comes into the world to redirect sinners and he calls it the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus came proclaiming. That's the central theme. He said, I want to redirect all people so that we end up, our goal, our souls lead us into the kingdom of God. To be a disciple, a, I mean, a, a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be a person whose life has been re-channeled you know, I once was blind, but now I see amazing grace. You know how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me? Because the idea that John Newton was getting at was that his life, he was a former slave trader, his life was moving, was being channeled into a direction that would end poorly for him and everyone else. And so Christ Jesus comes along and redirects our life towards another end. Uh, a few years ago, I, I was in Germany. And I was on a train. I was traveling there by myself. I was over there taking a, a German class. And my German is not good, all right, at all. So, but I'm reading this German article, and I've got my English-German dictionary with me, so I get words I don't know, and I can, I can look it up. And I came across a word about a um, um, bishop in Germany, and they called him a Zeelsorger. A Zeelsorger. And I thought, well, what in the world is a Zeelsorger? Literally, it means the care of souls. It's someone who provides care for the soul, and it's kind of a term of endearment for a pastor. Because ideally, a pastor's job is to be an agent through whom the Holy Spirit saves souls, right? I mean, I, that's what this is all about is to getting people's lives redirected when they are misdirected and keeping us on track when we tend to go off track, when we tend to leave the riverbed in search of, you know, fairer water, so to speak. I think it also describes beautifully the ministry of Jesus because he was a Zeelsorger. 
He was a person who came into the world to redirect human lives towards a fitting end because our lives are moving in some direction. The gospel is that Jesus Christ cares about us enough that when we're lost, meaning when our lives are meandering in the wrong direction, he comes to put our lives in a new direction. Now let's turn to the gospel lesson. It's the lost sheep and the lost coins, and of course there are also lost people. It talks about tax collectors and sinners. I like that word because I'm one, all right? I'm, I, I'm one of those sinners that he talked about, all right? And so are you, by the way, so I'm not being overly humble, all right? I'm a sinner preaching to sinners, all right? So and, and that would include the various riffraff of that world, you know, gang members, criminals, losers, prostitutes, and at the very least you could say, well, pastor, I'm not among that, but you would be. <laughs> Left to our own devices, everybody would be exactly there, going in the wrong direction. And that's what Jesus comes into the world. And, and, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are saying, hey, look, these people, they've got to get their lives on track. We're going to stay over here in the, among our holy huddle until these people get their lives on track. And Jesus says, hey, guys, don't you realize we've got to be out there helping people to redirect their lives towards an end, towards a goal that is fitting for a human being? When we read these horrible things in the paper and we read of people whose lives end in just horrible places, that's not what God wants for his people. And so God sends Christ Jesus into the world. And it says these sinners were drawing near. That's a beautiful line. They're drawing near to Jesus. Even then, their lives are being directed because when we draw near to Christ Jesus, we're really saying my life is being directed towards an other end, towards another goal, towards another telos. And these tax collectors and sundry sinners, their lives were being redirected because Jesus cared about them, because Jesus was a zealzorger. He was a man, a person who cared for souls, who cared about where people's lives were going. Now, I usually don't do this, but I want to read. It's a rather lengthy uh, sermon illustration, but I, I read it a while back, and I, you know, I have files for such things, and it's written by a pastor from Canada, um, Hugh Reed, who tells this story about this, this young man who lost his way. His name was Alan, not his real name, all right? Alan came to me at my previous church wanting to be baptized. He was a child or victim of the me decade. You know, that sense, I'm going to put myself first. Well, that's going to lead you astray. And he felt compelled to leave home and family to find himself and, of course, lost himself in the process, becoming a stranger to himself and the world, wandering the streets of Vancouver, trapped in a world of drugs. One night he managed to get off the street for a night in one of the shelters. He crashed into the bunk staring up at the ceiling, listening to the groans, and trying not to be overcome by the stench of the strangers in the bunks around him. He didn't know where he was, and he didn't remember who he was, but he wanted it to be over, and so he considered how he might take his own life. He was shaken out of this thought when someone came and called out a name from what seemed like another world. Is Alan Roberts here? That had been his name once, but he hadn't heard it for some time. He hardly knew Alan Roberts anymore. He, it couldn't be him being called, but the caller persisted. Is there anybody here by the name of Alan Roberts? No one else answered, so he took a risk. He said, yes, I'm Alan Roberts. Your mother's on the phone. <laughs> he said, my mother? No, you've made a mistake. I don't know where I am. My mother certainly does not know where I am. If you're Alan Roberts, your mother's on the phone. Unsure of what to do or what to expect, he decided to go to the desk down the hall, picked up the phone. Alan, it was his mother. <laughs> it's time for you to come home. Mom, I don't know where I am. I have no money, and you don't know where, what I'm like anymore. I can't come home. And she said, it's time for you to come home. There's a Salvation Army officer who's coming to you with a plane ticket. He's going to take you to the airport and get you home. She hadn't known where he was. She just called every shelter and hostel for months until she found him. He went home and supported and loved by his mother who had never ceased to know him even though he had forgotten himself. 
and influenced and inspired by the faith that had sustained his mother and her hope and love. He began to attend church, and one day he came to my office asking to be baptized. <laughs> you see, that mother embodied a Zalesorger, someone who cared enough about someone she loved to know that it was not God's will for her son's life to end in suicide or drug addiction and all the rest. And that's the ministry that Christ Jesus came into the world. It's the ministry he's given us. We are called to be those who are about the business of saving souls. Not just this immaterial, ghost-like kind of thing, you know, you talk about, but about changing lives, redirecting lives towards a goal that is fitting for a human person, not to end in a cesspool. Our Lord wants every life to be directed towards God and towards God's kingdom. When I was first in the ministry, I worked with a, a pastor. Heck, he was probably about my age. <laughs> this was 34 years ago. And uh, Pastor John Dennis, and they're in Pittsburgh. And uh, he was an old bachelor pastor, pretty stern, learned a lot from him, you know, pretty tough guy. And he had a certain fire and brimstone kind of way to preach sometimes, you know, about getting sinners saved and, and saving souls and so forth. And, uh, but he did that not because, you know, it was a um, legalist, but because he cared about people and because he wanted people's lives to be directed towards a proper end. When he died, uh, three of us pastors went to see him. Uh, he had cancer, and we went to see Pastor Dennis. That's all I ever called him. And Pastor Dennis, we talked to him a little bit, and he looked very ill, and he said, boys, I'm going to pray for you. And guess what he prayed? That our ministries would be about saving souls. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know, we shouldn't leave that to the Baptist. Huh? Amen? Amen? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> just maybe, the Lord Jesus has placed us in this time, this place, in order to be agents of salvation, to redirect the loss towards a good, a better end, that our lives would empty in the end into God himself, where we would be embraced by the Father. Maybe now and then we need to hear this. Repent, come to Jesus, and he will re redirect our lives toward God, and he will save our souls. He did mine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.